Hey guys, BBI here. I want to stop and say thanks. Thanks for tuning in and checking out whatever the video is about that's about ready to come up next. If you could take a minute and hit subscribe, I'd greatly appreciate it. And if you enjoy what you've seen here, make sure to hit the like button. We'd greatly appreciate your support. Anyhow, guys, all that aside, let's get on with the show. So, <clears throat> this whole trip has come to an end, and uh, this is the last one of these segments for a little bit. We've got other things I've got to go do. i got to remember, it's not my job to interview people, it's not, I'm just doing this as a, a fun little side thing to help keep history alive, okay? And uh, I'm telling three different stories. The guy's story that I'm interviewing a little bit of my own story, plus I'm keeping you in the loop on where I was at on my trip. So I'm done. This is literally my last day in California. And I set this interview up for early in the morning. Um, that's when Billy wanted to do it. And I rented a hotel room for us to do the interview in. And <laughs> um, believe it or not, there was people taking bets if Billy was going to show up or not, they uh, were calling around. Oh, is he going to show? Is he not going to show? Is he going to come? Is he not going to come? They were taking bets, placing money on it. And uh, guess what? My privilege and your privilege, you actually showed up. I finished this interview. Um, I went on into Sacramento from here, went and sat down and did the interview with Mud Duck Sharky, and then proceeded to drive the nine hours home. And I was home that night. And I was really ready to come home. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I was missing, the, missing home. And it was nice to be home from off the road. Only to come home and then as soon as I start to shoot the Sharky video, realize that I should have just continued north and gone and seen my buddy Prime. So then I turned around and drove to Seattle and spent the night and then turned around and came back. Crazy grand tour. But here we are, we're at the conclusion of this thing. Now I'm going to start this with a little story. I am six foot four and every inch of it and probably 330 pounds. 766 is probably six foot five and probably 350 pounds. And every nickel diamond stack weight of that. So I meet him downstairs outside the hotel and he pulls up and he got lost, literally got lost coming to the, the hotel. He, he, he went to the hotel directly next door. There's two hotels in a row, and they're building this holiday, and he thought I was in the holiday inn for some reason. I don't know why. So he called me. I'm like, no, man, you got to come over one more road. Just come over one more one more spot. So he parks. I meet him out front. And he gets out of the car, and the car goes from like this. You know, it's, it's sitting like this. And goes, whoop. He gets out of the car, whoop, back up flat. He's a big guy. And I mean big dude. He gets out and goes, damn, you a big old stack of bricks. I thought you were a little guy. I'm like, hey, you ain't no slouch yourself, Billy. He goes, damn. Man, it's been a long time since I've been able to look one guy, one radio operator in the eye. That's cool, man. That's cool. So we go to get in the elevator, and he steps on the elevator. Boop, boop, boop. And I proceed to get in with him on the elevator, step in, and the elevator goes, whoop. <laughs> it's sunk down about that far. I'm not kidding you. I said, damn, man, I wonder what the max load rating is for this elevator. I'm looking around the elevator for a data tag, can't find nothing. He just chuckled. He goes, well, yeah, we're big boys. Let's see if he can lift us. So the doors close, and uh, the elevator goes to move, and it's like, meow. <laughs> it starts going up with both of our asses in it. gentlemen thank you all for watching this series um there's a bunch more coming it sounds like i've got a trip to new york planned um back east it's coming right along um, i've got quite a few people that um, really want to get in on this process to be able to share their history and i think that's great 
um, it's going to take multiple trips and this is going to take a lot of time because at the end of the day remember my only function in radio really is the most part is to fix equipment okay and I got to fix the equipment to make the money to go on the trips so just hang in there with me. There's more of these to come. There's many, many, many more of these to come. Um, I got some big names on the East Coast that want to sit down and do this. They've all reached out. My phone has gone crazy with this. And I personally say thank you once again for tuning in, following along, giving a thumbs up, um, enjoying these videos, giving me positive reinforcement on them everybody being patient and understanding why I'm doing this the, the people that have their equipment here for a pair being patient and uh, it's just been a wild ride and still only one person has had something negative to say one there's always one so what can you do gentlemen mr. seven six six Right on cue. Yeah, they, I got a guy that worked for me, Yeah. like two, three days a week, and what he do, he wants to do too much so he can get paid more. Whatever he can cook up. Right, there you go. So how the heck is out of hole? Beautiful, clean, and receiving 47,000 Californians a month. What? My, one of my buddies moved, uh... I'm gonna clip this on your lapel, okay? And then you yeah. just throw it in your pocket or lay it on your lap. Uh, one of my buddies moved, he moved, he just moved, he, he took five loads so far up there. Who was what? Uh, one of the, one of the technicians that was down here. He took five loads <laughs> that way already. What was uh, what? Uh, a load, moving his house, you know, you know, he got all his ham equipment and and all that, and they bought a place for the barn, and that's what he wanted, so he can be out with elk and deer or whatever. And uh, they even took five loads. He said he knows that he knows how to get there by heart. <laughs> so uh, he's he's out in the rural area, but that's where he want to be at. Yeah. We bought on my way down. I stopped in Lake Havasu, and we bought. This guy's entire estate, all his towers, wow. all his equipment, everything. His old lady, she's been trying to sell all of it for like two, three years. And she's like, just if you'll get it out of here today, and I mean, dude, it was all in totes. Wow. Yeah, so I had a company come and they, they grabbed all of it. And my buddy Zane, he came and grabbed all, of, pretty much most of it. And we're buying up equipment like it's going out of style. Wow. Yeah. Mm. So where'd you start in radio? And by the way, gentlemen, we are joined by the legendary 766, <laughs> the king of the hill, California. <laughs> I don't know about the king of the hill, but anyway, uh, but when, I, I, when I actually... Been out front for decades, don't yeah. shit nobody. <laughs> okay, uh, actually, I started in the military. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to drop this mask down. Uh, okay. You're not going to... Yeah, I already got my shots. On this. Yeah, I, got, I got my two shots. The last one's on May, uh, April 1st, my second shot. Uh, anyway. Uh, Let's take it off, brother. You can hurt nobody's feelings. Yeah, anyway, uh, we, uh, uh, let's see. In the military in 1970, I went in, and I was a radio operator in the Jeep. The one you slide in, click, and you talk on a repeater or whatever. That's where I got started. And then when I come out of the military in 72, uh, everybody's talking on CB radio. Everybody. Everybody and his brother has CB. So I get one and I put it on my, my new Monte Carlo. But 
I really didn't want to put a hole in it. Long story short, they wouldn't let me talk. I go, oh, man. Everywhere I go, I go to Oakland, go anywhere. They wouldn't let me talk. They said, you need to get some power and come back. I said, what's power? I am. I say, they wouldn't let me talk. Right. So that, 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 that pissed me off because they wouldn't let me talk. So uh, um, anyway, so what I did was uh, uh, I got, I got, a, I put what, when I, after I put that in the car, I put up a ground plane and put a TX-75 in the house on a power supply and tried to shoot skip. Well, my ham operator friend that I, I was raised up with, he said, man, you gotta get rid of all that mess. I said, man. And uh, so that was about 73. And I put up a, a shooting star and I thought I was God, gift to earth. I had a skipper 300 and a shooting star. I mean, not a shoot star, yeah. I had a Skipper 300 and I had a Cobra 89. I thought I was God, gift to earth. I could talk a little bit. Man, I'm going to have to cut that off. But uh, anyway, so that lasted for a little bit. And uh, that lasted for a little bit. And then uh, I went and got me a shooting star. And I didn't know how to put it together. So a ham operator friend of mine called... Uh, uh, Batman, Worldwide Batman, he come over and put a shooting star up. And then, uh, this is in like 73, I started shooting Skip. And the guys in Sacramento wouldn't let me talk, but I didn't care, I knew them. Uh, Soul Man and Papa Cool, they wouldn't let me talk. But anyway, so I started talking more and more Skip. So then I got smart, and the guy go, well, let me come back and put up a, uh, Put up a, uh, he said, let me come back and put up a six element uh, a laser 400. He said, you'll get out a lot better. And uh, I got, when he got me a KW, and uh, so I started getting out really good. You know, this is like 74. And then by that time I was selling insurance, and this is where it get interesting. I bump into the Glenn guys, and I didn't really care, you know, about you know about the amplifiers that much, but I was get I was selling amplifiers for them on commission, and then that's that's what got me going, and working on commission. Every time I sell an amplifier, I would make like a hundred bucks or whatever. It depends on the amp, and they had the factory with all the sixteen hundred Bs, the twenty four hundred Bs, all lying around the wall. It was like probably a hundred of them. All these women putting them together. I come over there on a Saturday morning to tell him that uh, I need to pick up another amp. And I got there, and I'm going to make a long story short, the door was cracked about this far at the factory. It was Saturday morning, and no, nobody's around. And I go, so we didn't have cell phones. You got to remember, you know. I got on the CB, and I called uh, Dirt Dauber, and I called Glenn Jr. I said, man, I'm down here at the at the uh, deal over here next to the freeway and uh, I say the doors open nobody's here and the display room was about the size of your room and all the, the display room all had the finished amps and then you walk out that door and then that was a and he said man he said nobody's there he said uh he started calling out different names he said is Bill there Bill was one that the he said what about Dave and I said no nobody's here and he said the doors open and I said yeah we was on the CB. He said, man, stay your ass there. Don't leave. <laughs> I stayed there, and I, it was probably, at that time, it was probably $20,000 amplifier, you know, on the displays. So I sit there, and then all these big old white guys come flying with these 4 by 4s running in there because they own the place, you know. They, you know and uh, they come in there, and they go, oh, Sugar Bear, please, thanks, man. Oh, my God, thanks. And then after that, I was, I was, you know, I was, you know, I stayed there. I watched. You know, I could have drove off. You know, that's not my thing. Anyway, so I stayed there, and they, they really took me in. Then, so I sold a few amplifiers. I sold, you know, on commission. And then, uh, uh, old man Glenn built built this 
a big old box for a preacher. And I'm gonna, I'm, I'll cut it down to the story. He built this two, two 1,000 A ceramics. You got to remember, this is in the 70s, early 70s. And he said, they took me in like a son. And he said, yeah, come over here. And we can say. So they, when they sold me that amplifier. It sold for $5,500. They let me have it for $3,200. I gave them $2,000 down. I brought back $1,200 when I picked it up. That was back in the day. And, uh, and uh, we took down my laser 400 and put up a flat side 8. And that's, and he told me, just do everything I tell you. He said, you know, he said, but he said, they, and they, they was on Channel 21. They would come down to Channel 6 and listen and li look at me destroy the van. I had a flat side eight on a 70 foot Rome tower. I had two 1008 ceramics driving it with a bath of Yaces because it was all on screen. And he said, don't put nothing else in front of that, that box, but just that. He said, if you do, you're on your own. And I talked in that box, it would never break. It was about this tall, about that wide, it was on wheels and it had 18 lights in the front. And it had all the, you know, step starts and the, the green lights and everything. You couldn't hurt it because if you had a tuner, the, the interlock would come on. Anyway, I sit there, now I'm up against all the guys with the Skipper 300s and the Phantom 500s. You know, I'm up, that's who I'm competing with on the airway for, for its power. But the real secret was my location in the, the antenna. And then I, I could do, I could do like 25, 2600 bird, but I, I can do peak, I could do over 5,000 peak. And then guy was out there with them Skipper 300s and them uh, uh, Mako 1000. I would run over them like a tank, man. And I would shoot Skip all day long when I was off. And they couldn't stop me. And they go, uh, so they, they wanted to come over there, so I let them come over there. And they go, man, you beating us with them two low tubes? Man, we got, we got four Zs. I say, you, I say, go get two more Zs. They go get two more Zs, I run right off top of them. You know, just run off the top of them. And they went on, and pretty soon, they go, damn. They couldn't figure it out. So finally, by, by, that was in, by, by the 80s, they they starting to catch up. They're trying to figure out what was going on. So the guy's starting to get, you know, get smart. So when they did that, we, uh, uh, Ted, one of the engineers for uh, uh, Glenn, he said, man, he said, uh, he said, it's time for you to step it up. I said, oh, okay. And uh, right here, right here, right here in not Fairfield, but uh, Vacaville. There's a factory over there. He had, all, he had, they had a, a sub office over there. And he built me a, a 10,000, uh, a 4CX 10,000 with a pull tube in it. And, uh, and it, was a, it, was, it was a nice rack and everything. So when I, when I took that home, I just wiping the guys out. Now I got, I'm up against guys with 4-2 Z-Box, thought they were the king. And I would just spam right over top of them. <laughs> And man, uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't even nice. So it, it stunned the CB world because I could take Southern Cal condition from them. They couldn't, they, they didn't have enough. And it actually wasn't all power. It was the, the antenna, the location, you know, you know how that goes. And, and even when they got conditioned, they were scared that I was going to run over them. And I did, you know, I would run over them, talk trash and, I never cussed or nothing like that, but just you know, run over and stuff. And uh, that got that went on for for a long time, and then uh, uh, and then I just you know time went by and I moved and I bought a bought a big crank up tower, a big old uh, it was a DX eighty six. It was in a QTS book called DX eighty six crank up tower. I'll find it. We'll throw a picture in there. So yeah. You can see. Yeah, anyway, I had that. And I would crank that DX86 all the way to the top. And I put up a 60 foot. I didn't know what I was doing because Batman quit building my beam. I built a 60 foot flat side. And I didn't know, I didn't know, didn't know what I was doing. All I, I had the land, I had the, the material. And all I did was put 20 more feet on that flat side eight and move the measurements. I didn't know what I was doing. And it just put it together. And I got a match. And it worked, 
and I had that 10,000, and I, I ran in guys over. Man, this, when I did that, it was just, they, was, they go, God damn. He said, man, we're doing this, doing that. We can't stop you. I go, well, you know. So then they changed my handle to the West Coast balls and all that, and I go collect all this and that. And, and uh, then pretty soon, they start catching up with that damn 10,000. So uh, I went back, and Ted was getting, he had got old. He said, man, he said, uh, he said we, could, we can do you another deal. You say that like that's a condition or something. Like, man, you, you, you caught herpes or something. No, you, you went and got old. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. But he, he said he, getting, he, he said his eyesight was bad. Right. Yeah. And the old tech said that his eyesight was getting bad. And he said, man, uh, you know, I'm getting, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm kind of, I'm not scared of, uh, of the, the high voice, but you say my, I don't have the, what you call it, like I did. So we ended up putting a, a 15,000 J, putting a box in, and then I was rock and rolling then, you know. When I started put that, and then I built a 65-footer, and then I, I sold that tower to Catman in Georgia and put up a 100-foot triax uh, uh, crank up. So I always hung out at the second wavelength. And so I ran that, I ran that box up until... Uh, Oh, God, I don't know, like a few years ago. I don't know, it's been like six years, to be honest, something like that. And they couldn't, they couldn't, stop, they couldn't stop that box. And then all I was driving it with was a 2100B, you know, because I was on screen. They, they, they seemed to couldn't stop it, you know. So now I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm getting retired. I, 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 you know, I sold all my equipment, all my trucks and stuff, because I, I, I had to go to the hospital for three months, 11 years ago. And then when I come out, I always wanted to, I always wanted to do a retirement station, you know, you know. So, because once I got old, I figured I couldn't spend the kind of money, because I spent a lot of money, man. I didn't tell you about all that, but it was a lot of money spent in between that. About it. Yeah. From a two pill to a 40,000 in five years. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but anyway. C3, man, he's cruel, dude. He goes, when you first come out there, you were corny as shit. He goes, you're getting it figured out finally now. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate you saying that on video. It really makes <laughs> me feel good. Yeah. But. So, uh, so uh, I got hold to, uh, I got hold to Bruce, and he just died. He just died a month ago. Uh, the engineer. And he he designed me a he designed the uh, he said man you know your Glenn technology was good back in this day it was you know you ran screen I didn't know anything I knew what ground and grid was I mean I knew you know you you know you could build a box with the less power supply you need a lot more drive I, I understood that you know and they they sit and like give us classes of why we doing this and why we doing that and they say well. If you on if you on screen and you on AB one, uh, your modulation is clipped in with the carrier and all that. So I understood all that, you know. So uh, when I got ready to do my retirement station, uh, uh, I took my took my tower down, went to a four inch boom, went to a seventy two foot four inch boom, with the big elements, direct feed and all that, and then uh, Bruce. The old man, he was a he was a head. He was supposed to be the the king, the king of the four CXs, and uh, he was uh, he he knew all the people at Conco. He knew all the people at man. He knew he knew everybody. You talking about a Tetro Smart? Because uh, he was building them, sending them overseas, and they couldn't break. Because those those Arab didn't didn't play that, you know, over in Kuwait and stuff. And they you know, they say send thirty thousand, they were sending thirty thousand, but they wanted that box to work, you know. So they were paying big money, you know, for them four CXs. So he designed me one and he said, Well, what you wanna call it? I said, Well I said, you know, I was all Glenn all my life. He said he said, uh, this is gonna be like a uh uh, it's not a door slam. This is gonna be like a pro mod. I go, well, pro mod is a is a race car <laughs> that's sitting low, and it comes out hard. Bam! He said, yeah, let's call it a pro mod. So they designed me a pro mod, and I changed the antenna around, and then uh, 
I, it took a while to get, to get it adjusted because it was new. And they put a big, big ass ballam about this big up underneath my tube. And they were sitting there, I was looking at them, and I said, man, I never seen no input. I say, how do I neutralize it? He said, you don't. And they had all these big straps running run away from this bottom up underneath my tube. He said, and it's going into two big old long resistors about this big. He said, it forces that tube, it forces your whole system to stay on 50 ohms. You don't have to, you don't have to neutralize it, because before with the Glenn box, I had a neutralization plate in there. And you turn it, you know, and the, you turn it to the left, and the, you have left, less capacitive, and to the right. You might have seen that. On, uh, yeah. Anyway. Entry amplifiers all the time. Yeah. Anyway, so that, all that stuff, uh, we, they never use it. So all his, all his stuff is all punched in with a computer, and then he just put in the parts. But he knew exactly what part to stay with what. And then they put that thing together, and uh, uh, we had a, a, it was something, it didn't go out, but uh, anyway, everything was there, but I just, I wasn't used to it. And he said, no, don't, he said, uh, don't, don't try to cram with a lot of watts. So they put a 1G, I'm telling you my business now, real business. They took a 1G and built it just designed to push that tube and my Yesus to push that 1Z. And he said, what are you going to do? You're not going to work that Yesus, and you're not going to work that Z. And the envelope by that 1Z, uh, 1Z is going to hit that big 4CX. And you're gonna, your ARP is going to be so strong on the airway. He said, you'll never get beat in your condition. I go, well, nobody ever get beat in their conditions, you know. He said, but you'll be able to reach out around the other conditions. I said, well, that's being arrogant, man. He said, yeah, he's <laughs> being arrogant. And uh, so uh, I had my retirement money, you know, and I got, I, I ain't going to lie, I got some inheritance. I got big inheritance. We sold a house right two blocks from Bob. My sister died. And uh, me and my brother was, a uh, uh, what you call it? So what I did, I said, I, I don't want to have to spend no big money being retired, you know. I said, you know, I'm sitting here, you know, with four grand a month, and my bills are nothing no more. And I said, I'm used to making 12, 15 grand a month when I had my business. So he said, well, what I would do, I would get, I would buy two tubes, and uh, two tubes cost more than most guys pay for their whole station, you know. I mean, you're talking uh, down to ten thousand dollars. You know, did the first I? First forty cost me nine thousand five hundred bucks, and the second one was ten thousand five hundred dollars, and that's just the tube. Said so now you know. Okay. I'm in the same wheelhouse, yeah. brother. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. yeah, that tube there was sixty. Sixty. Uh, Cause I, I asked him what was the two well the the new one sixty five six around sixty five hundred dollars, and then uh, I got a I got a rebuilt for a bag up and this sits in my house under the kitchen table in a box still still there, and uh in the laundry room and uh I don't even you know when guys come to the radio room they don't they don't they they'll see the the big tube in the box but they don't see the bag up tube because guys are always wanting to man let me you know you know how they do you know because I had some show me the knobs show me the box with the yeah. knobs on it yeah. yeah they had because I had the tens and fifteens all sitting on a, a deck over there and the ones I had went through all that for years you know and then I sold a lot of them and uh so okay. So I'm gonna stop you, and you're gonna, I'm just gonna let you go. But I'm, I'm okay. Gonna stop you. So your very first handle was Sugar Bear. Uh -huh. When and how did you go about becoming seven six six? The license plate on my car. The license plate on my car was seven six six. What was the car? It was a Cadillac uh, sedan uh, for a two door two door. Uh, it was a seventy six Cadillac. I bought it when it was a year old. And it was red, dark red with the half padded top, sport, true sports. And the, the, the license plate was EVY 766. I just took the 766 off of it. And what motivated the change? So I got busted using Sugar Bear. Gotcha. I got busted in 77 on the key. I was on the mic. 
I was on the foot paddle. Well, I didn't even have a foot paddle. Well, I was on the foot paddle. <laughs> I got a, and I was talking okay. to. Clack, try that again. So you were on the foot paddle. I was on the foot paddle talking to a drummer boy in Camden, Arkansas. I got a knock on the door. I go, who is it? He said, FCC. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, man, I got, I got this stuff. I rolled everything out. Except for the, I had the bird meter, and uh, I had a something over there. I forget. Anyway, I, I was barefoot by the time I let them in. And uh, they, they got in, and then he goes, well, you know, uh, you're running way illegal. I go, okay. And the way he was talking, I knew they had me by the, the webbles. Right. And uh, he said, well, what I'm going to do says, you don't have no license, you don't have no ham license. I said, no, no, sir. He said, I'm going to write you up for excessive four watts, excessive 150 miles, uh, all frequency, uh, something about not open the door, and there was one more thing. But I knew they had me by the balls. And I go, I go, okay. I say, well, what? I say, I'll tell you what, uh, I was still living in town. Cause I was killing the town. He said, uh, "What?" Uh, I said, "What can I do?" I was walking into the door and was all over it because I was glad they didn't take my equipment or uh, what they saw. Uh, and I say, "He said, man, he said we we are all over the place." He said, uh, uh, "If you got rid of your complaints, we probably wouldn't even be here." I said, "In other words, if I moved out in the country," he said, "I'm not going to tell you to do that." He said, "But." You would help your own cause if you, you got out. So you're saying the quote would be more like, if the complaints stop, we go away. Right. And now the, the, the police department was on a block away. The fire department was right next to him. Jesus. And the, the fire chief <laughs> the one who called in. Anyway, so I said, okay. So I talked barefoot for about two months. And I was working for Halliburton then. And I was a boss at Halliburton by then. I was making... Oh, I was making uh, I say I was making like thirty two hundred a month. I was big shot, you know, thirty two, thirty. You gotta remember that's in the seventies. Yeah, that'd be like twenty grand a month. Yeah, yeah. no, no, thirty two hundred a uh, a month. Right. No, but a, a year I, I was making about. No, uh, no, no, no. What I'm saying is today that's in the seventies. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and today's money it'll be big money a month. So I went out. Drove down the road and bought the first place that was for sale that was outside of town. I, and there was a, I bought the place and there was a, it was a little bit over an acre of land. And uh, he told me how much it cost and how much down. And I go, damn. I had all of it down, but I didn't have nothing for the closing costs and all that. So my father was rich. So I went over there and he said, son, he said, you know, I don't loan my kids money. But he said, since you're buying the house. He said, uh, I'll help you with the, uh, with the down so you can have a little working cash. He said, but you got to pay me back in a year and a half, and I don't want you to pay me. We write up a contract, and you pay the bank. So I was paying the note. I was paying the note was five, like 505 a month on the original note and paying him 150 a month on the other money that I loaned. And anyway, so they got me in there. I got my tower down there. When it got that big crank up tower, then uh, this is like six, eight months later. I'm back. I'm back rolling good. Shouldn't skip. I'm not nervous no more. I'm out in the country, and I even got out better out in the country. And I go, this is great. So they started calling me the West Coast boss because they was giving me trophies everywhere I go. I go to Texas, everywhere I go, they they, they pile me up with trophies and and all this. And uh, I didn't really let it go in my head. But I knew I had the advantage of, of having the Glenn technology in the back because guys are trying to chase me, ground and grid, trying to chase the big screen box. That's hard, man. Because if we take off the landing at 20 kW at the same time, now if I'm on AB1 and you and you uh, you you driving your box for 2,000 watts, trying to you know get you know you're not going you're not going to stay there with me. Because the uh, modulation and the, and the, the envelope was going to be different coming out the other end. 
So the, the Glenn boys always stuck that in me all the time. They stuck that in me and say, stay with the 4CX. And I'm not even saying it's the best, but it worked out for me. And so I'm not even used to it with nothing with a high drive. You know, right now. You mean low drive? Yeah, I mean, yeah. All I'm used to is a low drive. If I was to sell my station right now, and this runs perfect, if I sold it to the average CB, he would blow it up the first day. I agree with that. Yeah, because he would, he go, oh, it do 20K with 100 watts? I said, yeah, it do, it do 20,000, less than 100 watt drive. And that's Ken, 40 bird, swinging to 80, 90, and you're already at 20 kW. He go, man, so the average CB, the first thing they would do was go get a bigger driver. They would go put, they would put three Zs in front of it. And they'll slam it like that. And it would, it would just take, it, it would just, it would just at, at one point, it would just start coming back on the bird, you know. And the, probably the reflect would probably go, if they did something weird like that, you know. I got to go to. Uh, so that wouldn't work for the average CB. Right. I got to go to uh, Zonda and look at some of the wonderful trophies he's got hanging on his wall up there. Zonda. Zonda Enterprises, a, con uh, a ma uh, Manny shop. Oh, over in, uh, uh, yeah. uh, up yeah. in the Eureka, not Eureka, but. Uh, uh, right next door. Yeah, right next door, yeah. Yeah. Man, he's got some unbelievable stuff. He sent me some pictures this morning of the inside of the tubes where the guys just drove the whole shit out of them. Oh. The holes like where the screen is burnt a hole through the anode to the outside. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. I've, I've already seen them. CB, the CBers are unbelievable. We, well, at a Conco, they had a CB rack. Yeah. They had a CB rack, and I was looking, uh, I was, uh, Matt took me back there because there's a machine uh, right there on the right, right there past the rack, that they, they test the tubes. So I test bluegill stuff, and you know, because I sold a lot of tubes yeah, back in the I day. Tester in there right next to his blue and gray half seat. Right. Yeah. Well, if you if you go back out towards the office, if you look to your right, there's a rack right there. Yeah. And all them tubes that you talking about. Yeah, they're all melted down. Yeah. <laughs> Sideways. Did you see the trash can full of three thousands? No, I didn't. I didn't see that. But he walks by. Goes, you see that? It's all them goddamn CB. <laughs> well, he doesn't swear. He doesn't. It's all. The yeah, CBR. but what well, well, trash can of these anodes and they're like jet black, like blacker than your clothes. Yeah, but what was so bad? I, I knew some of the guys' names that was on the tag, and I was look over there looking and laughing. He go, "You know him, huh?" I said, "You fuck around, know him, you know." <laughs> and uh, he said, "Man, they called. And they said, well, we don't know what happened, man. It just, it just turned, it turned uh, red. Yeah, it blew up. Yeah. And uh." And uh, and I say, well, that one right there, I say, the guy, his blower, I said, his filament was on and the blower was off, huh? He said, yeah, you smart, huh? I said, yeah. I, I've seen that before, you know. You've seen it where the tube, like, <laughs> they have the, the filament on, the blower is not on, and then they'll kick the blower on, and so what the, the anode does is it shrinks, and it'll pull itself away from the center portion of the tube and pull all the fins off. <sighs> Man, he had this, he had this, like, 15, he was sitting there spinning the anode on it. He goes, it looks great when you look at it. He goes, Shh, just spins it with his finger. And it popped all the fins off the center portion of the anode. I was like, <laughs> damn. <laughs> anyway, I saw, I saw the rack. And the guy well, wanted to have the tube rebuilt. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he said, and then they, he said, they'll lie to you, and then this machine tells you everything, you know. I mean, they ain't going to stick that in the machine, but, you know, they, uh, but anyway, so I've, I had a couple of tours. They even gave me cups and stuff. And then uh, uh, the other guy uh, at Zomar, I've, I've been out there. And uh, I took him a bunch of duds, and he, he tested some tubes for me. He had a, a car shop next door to him. He's yeah. rebuilding cars. Me and, him, me and him hit it off real good. He's a good guy. I, I, sent, him, I sent him some people, but uh, I've been out there. Uh, he, was, he was really nice. So tell me about the, okay, what was your first break you went to that you can remember? Because I know you've been to a million of them. What was your very first break? <sighs> Out of state, you mean? Period. Your very first break. Very first break, probably, probably San Francisco or Las Vegas. Las Vegas, I went to uh, a break. Well, and then, you know, after... Uh, after the uh, 
the around the mid '80s, they started making me the MC. Then the every break I went to, I went to, I was up there with Prime. I was the MC there. I got pictures of me and Prime up on the stage. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, uh, when Baby got back, I was in the car with him. Ask Anthony when you see him. I was in the car with him one day, and we were going over to the. They were having a shootout, so I rode with Prime to go over to the listening station. The break was over. I was the MC. I was up there with him, and it was, uh, went out to the house, and I said, I'm going to go out and get in all of the cars. And I said, you're going to have to help me get out of the, the, the Lambo and all that. I went out and got in all the cars. Do you want to see some funny shit? See me and him get in that car together. Oh, man. Well, I can see him down, getting in there. Down, you got to reach around and push yeah. the And then you got to close the door, and it's like, yeah. You know, because it's... Oh. Wow. Yeah, we... Uh, I've ridden in that car once, and I told them I'm never riding in it again. Wow. I got in it, and they all laughed because I couldn't get out. And uh, there was... I'm doing one, man. I had I would roll yeah. down there like a roly-poly, my man. Yeah. And this is back... This is weird. This is way back. I'm sure it's a different car, though. Yeah. Now, but anyway, because he had a... He had a... Bar, he had a, like a... Uh, like a tennis court thing out there, and they had a, a deal with a bunch of doors on it. had the cars right there. Door, yeah. yeah. yeah it was at the old house. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, but uh, uh, I only been to the new house once when they had the break here when I won the World Boss thing. And, uh, but anyway, that was, that was pretty cool. But anyway, I emceed a lot of breaks, man, a lot of breaks. I mean, I emceed some of the biggest breaks ever. Ever since that was my next question. What's the biggest break you've ever been to? The biggest break I've ever been to was in Dallas, Texas. That was the biggest break ever. It was 12,000 plus. I was there. I didn't see everybody. I wasn't the MC. I was, I was what you call West Coast famous, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't the MC. Biggest break, 1978. What was it? What was the name of the break? Uh, the Rooster Challenge Jumpers gave it. And uh, it was in Dallas, Texas. It was twelve thousand plus. It was in the Jet magazine. It was a, it was the most they ever saw. They say it was the biggest black gathering ever in the United States. And I didn't hear about all that to where after. I, and I go, wow, I was there, but I didn't see everybody. It was too many people there. Didn't see everybody. And then I MC the biggest break that I MC, probably New Orleans. I, I advertise, I, I MC uh, a couple for them. I MC two breaks in Georgia, and one of them was super big, had 950 people at the shootout, 400 people at the ball, because I was, I was deep, deep involved with the break, you know. Uh, the most interesting uh, I MC was in Washington, D.C. and Las Vegas. Las Vegas was at the River Area Hotel. And I, back then, at that break, that's when I was at my peak of my bodybuilder. I used to be a bodybuilder. And I was at my very peak then, you know, 6'5", 260 pounds, 22-inch arms, you know. And I was, I was flaunting it, you know. And I had, I had the ladies, you know, to go with it, you know. And uh, what's the name? Uh, the preacher that built all the antennas in Texas, uh, Dr. He had all the daughters. I can't, you know who they are. Uh, anyway, I was going with one of the daughters, and it took me all weekend to get with her. But anyway, it was funny. It was funny. But, <laughs> you chased it all weekend, didn't you? Oh, yeah. And I thought I was God against her because I was a big time bodybuilder then. I mean, I was benching 460, and, you know, I was, you know, I had the little waist, the big arms, and, Everybody remember that, and it was some of the guys used to see me, and they would go, "Man, I'm glad you're a nice guy." I go, "Man, I always been a nice guy." I said, "I just like doing this, you know." And then, you know, I had all the stuff to go with. I was eating right, and then I had the everything. It was, it was clicking real good, you know. And then, uh, how old were you when I was in my heyday of bodybuilding? Uh, I was in my thirties. I was in my I was, uh, yeah, I was my strongest when I was about 37 because I was real disciplined. Because the, the guys, the football players that come in, 
they come in and they, they bench 310. They thought they were doing something. And I go over there and warm up with two, you know, at 220. And then I would do sets at 310, you know. <laughs> and they'd be going, shit. <laughs> you know, I'd do three sets of six at 310, you know. And, uh, and I'd say, and, you know, you don't max out when you go, you know, when you, every, every time you work out, you know. You build up to it in a cycle. Yeah. And it took years. I mean, I went from, I went from 160 in the bench to 310, it took six months. And to get to 400 pounds, it took two and a half, three years. Isn't that amazing how long it takes yeah. to step up? Yeah. Yep. But I was a big, out of shape guy. But I went, yeah, I went to, I went, but I know, but I went from, I went from 160 in the bench to 300 in six months. And then from, from 400, from 405 to 460, it took me another year. And it took a whole different trainer to, to work with me because it was starting to be a mind thing. And he had me working with 500 pounds. I couldn't, I couldn't pull the 500 off my chest, but I could do the 460 off my chest sometime, two times, you know. And uh, he said, you're doing good. <laughs> so now I couldn't, I, you know, I, I quit lifting every, every, after the hospital visit for three, three months. But uh, let's change let's change topics real quick. Let's go back to radio real fast. Can you take a minute and just talk with me about the white versus black amplifier growth in time? Like, did the white guy at every point come along and say, "No, we're gonna I'll let the black community have power"? How did the how did the black community start picking up amplifiers back in the day? Because I hear all kinds of stories about the separation of racism that took place there, and to me, it's like. Silliness, but did you ever experience any of that or see any of that? Well, I seen it, but I was the most fortunate guy because I was a Glenn. I was a Glenn raised guy. Like the appliance operators versus the the bowl guy. Yeah, they was they was feeding me the technology, and he said he said what they're doing. Over there, they're putting, I'm not knocking G boxes and all that. He said, what they're doing and what you're doing is, he said, uh, you're driving the roads and they, they're running around in a, uh, in, in a common gear Volkswagen. He said, you, you're not, they're not competing with you on the level. But you got to remember, I was raised by them. And I was, uh, I was, their, I was their hero on the bottom end. And they would do stuff for me. The, and come down to try and sick and watch to see how it would work. They said, man, you run everybody, they said, there's nobody on the band left. I said, yeah, I said, I had a good day. <laughs> Nobody's around, you know. I would run Southern Cal completely off the planet. I would deliberately run them guys off the planet. Just because they would talk shit at the break. And then I said, okay, I say, you got about, uh, you got about, uh, I said, but you got the time for that, I leave leave Los Angeles till I get home, you got that much time to talk. You know, I was talking shit, you know. Right, oh yeah. He go, man, you're not gonna stop. So, okay, I get home, I'm, I'm, you know. Then we would laugh and talk when she said, but I know a lot of them didn't like it. A lot of them took it personal. To this day, half of my CB sons are white, half of them are black. And that's no joke. I can give you the names, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, I have, you know, I have a lot of friends, man. 49 years on the radio, I have a lot of friends, man. And uh, I helped out a lot of people, and I got a good, I got a good deal with the Yesus. I got, I got more Yesus running in the United States than anybody, probably than Yesus. I got 60 customers out there, and they, they're all over. And I have very little bumps with them. But I won't sell everybody Yesus, or I won't work on everybody's Yesus. You know, me and a guy, we open a business together. And I won't, I won't, just like you, you won't, I bet you won't build an amp for everybody. No. <clears throat> In the beginning, I would take on whatever would show up. Now it's, I've mm -hmm. learned. You learn. You, you learn, you listen to the guy, and you're like, oh, no. But the other thing is, uh, there's so, I got such an excess of work that I only take on work once a year. So... Yeah, you're right. So I got Yasus all over. I got them from all the way from Bluegill to 549 to JR. I mean, you name them. I got everybody. I got Brown Shoes in New York. I got three double O's. I mean, I got guys all, all over the spectrum. And 
a lot of, most of them I taught how to run them over the phone. Because I, I can tell you everything about a Yesu and how to run it. And I could be sitting in a closet in the dark. I don't even, you know, I got it like that with a Yesu. And, and so I have a big clientele like that. And, and guys know me and they, they know me not to try to beat nobody, you know. I would rather give somebody something off the Yesu or fix it for free than, than to beat them, you know. I don't want my name out there like that. And I don't want to get off track. And that's, that's the oldest trick in the world. Don't follow me. Don't follow that pro mod and that big beam out there on my condition. Don't follow me. If you follow me, I'm going to drag you in a rabbit hole. <laughs> that's the oldest trick in the world. I'll drag you on my condition in a rabbit hole, and I'll run all kinds of fires on you. <laughs> Some of the shit that comes out of your mouth. <laughs> Man, where the hell does this crap come from, dude? Like, you tell me the story about taking uh, Prime to the chicken fights. Yeah. <laughs> never, never, never talk to you before, call you up on the phone and start talking to you, and you're like, oh, man, I got to tell you about the time I And he come down here, isn't it? I rock Z. Yo, tell the story. Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> God, the stuff that comes out. Uh, but, uh... And they, so most people not now, but they thought we were enemies. And they go, man, he's like my son. I said, when, he, when I met Prime, you know the story. He, I met him when he was 17 years old. He walked up. He was all dressed up in street clothes. I mean, slacks. And I go, who are you? He go, I'm Prime Minister. I said, what would you say? And, and Lockjaw was standing there with me. It was a bunch of uh, Caliber Junior and all that was all standing there. I said, he said anything with Prime. I said, man, man, you're a sharp kid, but man, that handle is going to cost you a lot of money. And, you know, he was, yeah, I know. I said, man. And then that's how, that's how we met. I was, uh, I was an MC at a, a, a deal in Portland, and I got my ass kicked in the mobile contest. I took second. Uh, uh, brain damage beat me with a Tennessee Walker, and I had a Varmint 600. Uh, and he beat me, and I went home limping. And I, you know, we was all we all was all laughing about it. And I said, man, I said, you know, I'm gonna get you. I said, I'm gonna come back. I said, I got a Varma KW, but the uh, the little pills things on the back is out of it. I said, I'm gonna come all the way back up here just to whip you. He said, well, just go home, make a U-turn, and get it and come back. You know, he was talking trash. Right. You know? Come on back up here. We'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but he, but we we went down. We had to go down like three times. And he got me, and I heard the, the gate. I said, yeah, he got me. And we still the best of friends. I mean, it wasn't no, no deal, you know. And we, that's when I had met Prime. And, uh, and uh, uh, me and Lockjaw used to lock up. Northwest Cone, we, we used to lock up just like, we would talk for an hour. We wouldn't let nobody get between us, you know. And so it wasn't until the other day everybody believed that the phenomenon of you being able to turn your beam north was a thing. Well, no, I didn't turn it north. <laughs> you came north to me, man. I sat there and watched it. Oh, no, I wasn't. You went from like 10 dB all the way to 60, and then you were, okay, I'm done talking to you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did. I did, but I didn't turn all the way. I didn't turn all the way, though. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I could have turned all the way, but what happened, it was, I was doing something, and somebody called me in the Carolinas. And I said, now swung it back around, you know. <laughs> I was sitting there talking with Motor Mouth, and it's like, oh, hell. That's BBI. Oh, hold on. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Boom. Okay. Now I'm going to go back over here and go play. It was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I didn't bring it all the way around. But I, I can bring it all the way around. But uh, when, uh, when, I, when I put that together, when I had to drag my line, I had to drag my line, and it's, it's real close to my, my cable. One of the guy cables on the tower when I drag around that way. And. I can actually talk up to the U without without my cable touching the the guy cable, but uh, uh, I don't I don't really want to stay there. I want to stay there. I go back. No, no, I get it. Yeah, I get it. but when I go to Hawaii, it's not even fair because I, I got all water between me and, uh, and Hawaii. So the very first person I ever talked to when I got my fifteen all running was you. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, I went out there and I'm I was sitting there digging with it and it's pointing south. Yeah. When you come up, you go, man, who's that in the corner? 
trying to sit down and dig it with us. Skip was running oh. west, and I, I pointed south. And we sat there, we talked for about 10 keys. And then you went back on to Mother Nature elsewhere. And then again, when I got the 40 running, just by chance, you were the first person I spoke to. Wow. Yeah, very first person. Man. Like, literally having a conversation with on the air. That's, that's pretty cool. So, I don't know what that counts for, but... Yeah. So, what's the biggest station you've ever seen, physically been to, watched run? <sighs> the biggest station I've ever seen was probably uh, up in the... Uh, and you probably seen the box. Up in uh, Minden, Minden, Nevada. No, nah, Minden, Nevada. And it, it weighed about 6,000 pounds. It wasn't called for the 11 meter band. You, are you talking about for the 11 meter band? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Uh. Mm. I didn't been, I didn't seen, you know, I've seen pair of 20s and pair of 15s, pair of 10s. The biggest single I saw was uh, probably bus driver or uh, the box I got now. That's the biggest one I ever ran was the box I got now. Uh, uh, I, I was a big box that was the, and the way I'm set up, and I don't even talk about my box, I'm set up with the voltages the way it's set. If I want to go to the goodie store, I ain't got to go walk out the door. I can turn my voltage up, you know. <laughs> I can turn the screen up, turn the plate up, and I got, I'm a whole new animal, you know. You know, if I had to go to the goodie store, but I, I don't feel that I have to. Uh, I, it's loading up my phone. I don't feel I have to go right now, you know, but uh, I, I don't feel like I ever have to go. I, so you designed and built your beam that you're currently on today? Uh, it designed, it, it, it was built, uh, no, I had help, I had help with the design, but I built, I physically built, built it myself. It was originally a 72 foot, four inch boom with 12 elements. And then when I called the engineers out to help me, <laughs> Soon they saw those twelve elements, they started laughing. <laughs> they go, "Man, that looks like a railroad track." He said, "But I can get you a lot more gain, but you're gonna have to uh, unass some elements." So I said, "Well," and they was on the clock, and I asked for the expertise because I couldn't get get the match when I built that one because it's four inch boom, and then they you can't use no three inch measurements messing with a four inch boom. Everything is different. So everybody had an MFJ. They got it down, they got it down. And when we first put that beam up, I think it was a nine element at 72 feet. And it was so powerful that we thought of that I would actually invite guys over to look at me with 300 bird, what I could do to guys and skip with 300 bird. And that's what, that's what made them believe in the antenna. They go, man, that guy's running a 3,000. That guy's running, he's running a 5,000. You took him down in the Carolinas. And I say, yeah, I'm not, I'm not on the foot pedal or nothing. That, you see, it's 300 bird. And uh, he go, man, that's that beam, huh? I say, shit, that's right. That's the beam. That's the game. And he said, man. And uh, I say, watch here. I said, watch, watch uh, Red Eye Crow. I said, watch here. And I reached over and hit the foot pedal. And put it up to about, about eight, nine thousand on the bird, and not say anything. Just sit there and go like that. And, 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 yeah, and just come out. And not even just with no 30, 40 watts. And the unkey. And, the, and the, the guy said, man, he said, hold on. He said, man, somebody just threw a big old dead sea, you know? I said, but I was showing the guys, you know, club members, how the DB game works. You know, I say, you know, that I say the biggest amplifier you got is your antenna. I say, yeah, I know I got a big pro mod in here. It's a lot easier to make the gain at the antenna once you get past the ten thousand than it is at the amp. Yeah, big time. But that was the smartest thing I've heard all year from a, a person. That was smart what you just said. It's a lot easier to make the gain at the antenna than it is at the amplifier. Because Mother Nature owns us. You know, we got to deal with Mother Nature. Yeah. You know, I mean, you could. 
uh, the the amplifier that, that weighed four thousand pounds. Then we had one at the shop over there had uh, it had four or five thousands in it, and uh, I disassembled it. It had four or five thousand A's, and they had like three or four two fifty B's driving it, and I disassembled it, and uh, we got that for dirt cheap, but we got it to disassemble for parts. That was the biggest one I've ever walked up on like that, that I had, you know, my name on it. And uh, back back then, but it was all for parts. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't know. I was, uh, bus driver was 40. You know, I've never, you know, I've never seen. Uh, uh, when me and Bob used to be cool, I was over there. I low, because I'm the one who set him up with Ghost Rider. That that was me. Yeah, that was, he He came, to, he was in the club then, he came to me and and we were cool and he said, man, uh, I just got beat on a box. I go, who beat you? He was somebody back east or something. He said, I want to do a bigger box. And he said, uh, so I took him up to the hills and he didn't like what he saw up there. So he said, I said, well, I got somebody, I know people that won't beat you. And he said, I know you do. I said, okay. Uh, he said, I like good looks. I said, okay, well, all right. I said, okay. I said, let me call somebody. I'll call Daryl and talk to him because Daryl was already my customer because I sold Daryl tons of coax <laughs> when I used to have the coax business. And Daryl, we were so good. Like, if you called me and I had it, I wouldn't even want to wait, wait for the money. You know, I just, because I... You know, you gotta remind everybody this is pre PayPal, pre digital pay, pre all that stuff. So you'd have to send a check or a certified. So, so Dale, Dale told me, I said, well, this box ain't for me. This is for uh, for uh, uh, Bob, Bob Burns. He said, okay, I don't think I know him. I maybe heard of him. And uh, so I'm not, I'm not really putting this business. I'm just telling you, I'm the, I'm the one who started him out with the Ghost Rider. So Dale told me, he say, uh, put 9,500, I'm going to give you my routing number, put 9,500 in my b &A account. And that's what got him kicked off with the, uh, you know, with the Ghost Rider camp. That, that was me. Daryl has been a good person to me. Straight up good yeah. person. And Do business, and then I got to go. Straight yeah. up. That's just the way he is. I admire that greatly. So all, all, that, all that Ghost Rider business up here kicked off for me because of the trust that I had in Daryl. And they didn't, they didn't know anybody to trust anybody like that, you know, to send that kind of money. So to start off, and then he took over from there because I didn't get in his business after that, you know. And then uh, I know his whole intention was to kick my ass, you know. So he went with the two tens, he went with the single ten. I would come over and load it up. And, uh, and you know, it was... We were still in the same club, and the club didn't want us to fight, you know. Yeah, let's and, stop there and let's circle back. How did the James boys enter your life? I've been known them. I've been known them ever since they it was in existence, and they tried to get me to come in as a president. I didn't want to come in like that. And I say, when I retire, I'll come in. Then I can make the meetings. And they go, that's fair. I say, but I will MC your break. I MC the break. I I will. Uh, I won't, I won't tassel with none of the James boys in the airway. They liked it, that part. And uh, they, uh, I, won't, I won't fight with the James boys, but uh, uh, I'd be the hit. I was a, before I was a club member 10, 12 years ago, I was a hit man for the James boys. I would watch it back, but I wouldn't fight with them, you know. I would beat up Southern Cal, you know. I beat them guys up. You know, because they were talking shit at the break. But I would never fight with the James boys, and I emceed two or three of the break. I emceed the big break in 15, 2015, and I emceed the one before that over by the airport. And um, uh, I told them they didn't have to pay for my hotel. You guys are cool with me. And then I, I, I got got in the club, and they wanted me to come in as a vice president. I could not. And they said, well, we even let you be the president. I said, no, no. That's because I got a big foot paddle. It don't give me nothing. You guys know the history. And I don't want, I said, I just want to be the hitman. I don't want to be, 
I don't want to be nothing. I don't want to be, honestly, I don't give a shit who you make the president. It doesn't, it won't, it won't affect the how I talk on the radio. And to this day, even when they had the last president around, they had the chair waiting on me when the meeting started. They wanted me to be the sitting there. I said, no, I don't want to be a president. I said, I'm serious. I say I don't need all that to be notarized on the radio. I say my foot power and that 316-pound antenna makes me who I am on the radio. It don't make being a president doesn't, you know. I, so who, was, I, who was the founding member of the James Boys Club? Probably, probably, uh, what's the name? He died. Then Skip Shooter became uh, the guy that can answer all that would be 26 0. He's the only original member, the only original Jane boy that's left. And me and him is like this. And uh, So the club's grown, the club shrinks, the club. Yeah. What's the biggest it ever became? Uh, probably uh, with the out of state members, we probably had 35 members, maybe 40. It's an exclusive club. Really. Yeah. And so the, the trick is, this is the head kicker with the James boys. Anybody can tell you. To be a James boy, you can't, uh, you can't use profanity in the airway, okay? I'm out. Thank God I'm a no club. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, uh, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't be doing no dishonest stuff to other sea beers. They, they, they don't like that. They, they, uh, they don't like that. All the F you stuff, we can't. I don't say it anyway. But they, that, that'll kick you out. So anybody like that, we would work out of the club. We would work, they would work, we would, get, we would get them out of the club. And they had guys to come in, to try to come in just so they could see what was going on. And they'll see what's in the bank account, but I don't, you know. So what, you know? Yeah, we started to break off. We had, we started to break off in 2015. We had like 18,000 in the bank. And we did the we did everything to make everybody comfortable, and we spent we lost like three thousand dollars, but we spent I don't know probably twelve thousand dollars on the break, you know. But we just buying stuff, giving people this, doing this. I was calling shots left and right. Bob Gibson, we paid for his room, paid for his ticket, paid for his, uh, his registration. I would do that for him. Uh, I had. Uh, Baker Man, he came down, he didn't have a place to stay. I'm not picking on Baker Man. And I said, hey, look, man, you're an icon up there. I say, uh, the hospitality room is my room. I'm not, I'm going to be in some chick's room. <laughs> I said, go there, take my room. Don't, even, don't worry about getting no room. Just take the hospitality room. It was a, a room like this, you know. It was a suite. I mean, I'm just saying, I would do things like that. And I would, I would, give, away, I would give away the bank. And then uh, uh, I, I would do everything with the club knowing about it. And I wasn't the president of nothing, but I, I had that big foot paddle. I called a lot of shots over there, you know. And I never would take advantage of that, but I'm just saying I was really good, you know, to the guys coming in. And, uh, and we fly guys in and this and that. And uh, so we were, uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, that's how, I, now I'm still, you know, I'm still a James boy. And then I advertise for him when we do something, but I, uh, I, I don't fight with my club members. And they all, when we did my new beam a year and a half ago, when, we, when the pro mod got done, they were all there. They were all there. And they, some of them had never even seen, uh, seen a beam that big, you know, because it was in the backyard sitting down. It looked like a railroad track sitting back there, sitting down on, on, the, on the rack. Because I had to redo it because this box wasn't nothing like the other box. It was, if you juice it with some more, with, with some more volts, <laughs> it would come unglued. And if you, if you wasn't right up there, it would, it would tell you real quick. You know, it would, when I went from the 3000 to a 6, I had to change a bunch of shit. When I went from the 6... The 15, I changed a ton of shit. And then <laughs> from the 15 to the 40, it was a whole new experience on changing even more shit. Man, I had lightning jumping off the end of the elements. I had coax ends blowing off. I had vacuum variables exploding. I had blockers blowing up. It was 
Yeah, I know what you mean by it coming apart. No. I had to bring down my driven element, my reflector, my first director. I had to fill them with metal. I had to taper all the tips of the elements. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the, it's a lot of work. Uh, uh, I sit there, I got my drive bird down here, and I got my dual section up here, sitting up on the wall, up on the rack. So I'm, I constantly, if you ever hear me on the radio, you hear me say reflect. You might hear me with two or three hundred watts, I'll say reflect. I'm watching that while, while the tube is warming up. I'm watching, because I, I did it this morning before I came over here. I keyed up and said reflect, and I knew... I knew what it was. I got a 25-watt slug on my reflex. And, uh, and I got the big slug on the left. And I watch the reflex, you know, uh, more than I do my output. And, it, you know, I know where it's going to be at. It depends on where my antenna. If I'm, if I'm going, my lowest match is going over Kentucky. I can look over Kentucky. And at 20 kW, I got around 15 watts of the reflex. If I swing it down the Texas, it'll come up to about 20, 22 watts of reflex. If I go to Michigan, it'll go all the way back to about 10, 10 watts of reflex. And I don't know what the hell my beam is seeing, but it's seeing something. My, in my place, it's trees. If I turn one direction, I'll see maybe about five or six watts of reflect at about 15,000 out. And I'll come the other direction and I'll see about one or two watts and I'll come a little bit farther and okay, now it's going to stop hopping up to about 20. <laughs> yeah. I, I key at 10 or 15. I don't key any other place. Yeah. No, there's no point. No, no. I, I didn't been there for they, uh, the guys up in the East Coast said, man, he said, it sounds like you're starting to pinch down when you pump up real hard like that. So I just, I just let it explode the envelope. I let it explode real, really. I key 10, modulate, goes to 35. That's yeah. it. That's well, it. And that's bird. Fuck it. Not even worth it. I come out, I come out keying 8, 9,000, swing to 22,000 at 80 watt drive, and I sit there and I can run cool all day. And if somebody pressure me, I was, I was a couple of days ago, somebody jumped me and I sit there and watch, and I jumped 10,000 on them like that, and I was cutting them off, bam, 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 bam. And then I dropped it right back down, right back down to 22,000. But I'm swinging into it. I'm not, I'm not trying to dig key 30,000 and, and swing back to 25. I'm not doing that. My box won't, I don't think I'll break it, but I, it, it, would, it wouldn't like that. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I run out of service. Yeah. I, I, don't know where, I don't know where I would end that uh, if I would just dump 300 watts in it. It would probably, I would have to retune it a little bit, maybe to see how far it would go. But I'm positive that it would talk back uh, on the big slug. It would talk back, it would talk back down. And uh, that ain't, the, the engineer would want to even want to hear me talk like that. <laughs> I can run it up to about 44 and then just talk and then you'll sit there and wiggle everywhere else it's going to come back. But I mm -hmm. throw out 68, but it's going to fall back. Yeah. I mean, you can hear the transformer out on the street just fucking howling. It's just, wow. Yeah. Well, I blew one before, so I blew the top. Shoot, it's a 50 kVA. The plate transformer in the box is 74.5 kVA. When I talk that transformer out on the street, my neighbor's tell me, goes, whoa, 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 whoa. It's talking. <laughs> wow. I blew the top off one. No shit. Yep. And it caught on fire. And you got that oil hot. And it. <laughs> It, the, it, the lid come off and, and it went boom like that. And the lights and I, I had I had been talking all evening. And uh uh the lights went dim in the house and came back up. And I went outside, all the lights went out. And I went outside and I smelled smoke. I went in the radio room, nothing in here. I walked back outside and I had to look up. And the lid, it was a fire. The lid is burning about that tall coming out of the top of the, the canister up there. The, the top of the canister came off. And it was it's sitting there on fire, nothing else. You didn't hear a kaboom or a bang? I heard, no, I heard a bang. It was, it was like a mild shotgun. It was like a shotgun that was muffled. That's what it sounded like when the lid come off. And uh, I go, wow. So I had to call the fire department, and they had to put some foam up there and to get it down. Then pg and &E come out. And they had to get up all, all the stuff that came out of that can. They had to take it away. 
They say it was radioactive or some shit. I don't know. It's PCB based. Anyway, they. PCB and then, uh, and then I didn't lie to them. I said, uh, uh, he said, what was he doing? I said, I was on the radio. He said, man, that thing is pulling. I said, yeah. I said, man, uh, I need some juice hauls. <laughs> Put a and, bigger transformer up there. Yeah. <laughs> he said, well, this one's outdated. And it wasn't outdated, he said, but because uh, it only runs my place. Right. And uh, so, anyway, that that was a big help, you know. And, anyway, but uh, I blew the lid off one before, I know. But <laughs> I did a lot of strange stuff. But I had, I've had a good turn in radio, real good turn. Being honest uh, helped out a lot. That's why my radio business thing is, is doing really good, you know. And I got a, uh, my location is, the only way I can get a better location is is get on the ship probably, you know. I got a, I got a location. So, and guys, when they want, when they want to call me and say, man, I'm going to beat you down. And I say, well, get in the car and ride by my house and look up and then look to the right and look and see where you're at before you decide you're gonna, this is going to beat me down. And I've had a couple guys do that. They ride, they go, man, ain't nobody out there, but there's a river right out there in front of your house. I say, I know it. I say, you still want to, you still want to do all that? I say, you know how much that location costs? And they go, no. I say, well, my house is still worth about 500000 with the land. The house is not worth a shit. You know, I mean, it's nice, but, you know. I say, but I hear land is, I say, I would never sell. I say, but that's a half a million dollar location. I say, you're going to have to whip the location. You got to get to the beam. Then you got to get to the audio and the pro mod. So you're going to have to get all, all of them. You're going to have to line your ducks up to take all them out consistent. Uh, popping me on a key and like that. But I say, I can guarantee you before the QSO is over with, uh, you're going to be laying on your back. I said, because you give me a chance to come up stages on my drive, you know, if I have to. And uh, so that's been, that's been, you know, and then watching, watch, you got to know, there's a lot to know, man, this stuff. I know you know it. You, you a bit. No, 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 I'm learning. I'm learning. You never stop. You, you watch that reflect. You watch where your beam is at. You watch the condition. Uh, I don't talk, some idiots I might not even talk to. You know, you know, you know, you gotta, you, it's, it's, uh, and I don't want to deal with that click. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, I mean, do 50,000 on the corner all the time and guys switch blading and guys are taking 10, 15,000 watts and running right over top of them because they got a better antenna and a better location and taking guys out that's doing 50,000 watts down the road. And I go, whoa, you know. All watts are not the same. A lot of guys got junk when they got junk watts. Look at Budweiser coming out there on 420s until he got his antenna right. He's putting 100,000 watts in the air, but the guys on single 15s are just running right over him. I was on the other end of it, so I know. Yeah, and so now he's finally getting his antenna kind of coming around. We're starting to hear him a little bit more. Yeah. It's not all about making that needle move all the way to the right. Yeah, yeah. That's so. all, but that antenna... Is where the rubber hits the road. Yeah. Well, they taught us that setting percent of your the biggest amplifier is the antenna. You know, and then they you say you go from your antenna down and work work your way. And the Glenn guys, and I was the only black guy that was in the Glenn camp. They loved me because I was just always on I so amplified for them. And uh and then when I saved that bill in that time, I told you the story. They would go, oh man, you could have drove off with a whole kind of stuff. But what good would it do me? You know, that's not me anyway to steal like that from somebody. But I don't steal from nobody. But I'm just saying, I was in like like Flint, man. And then those guys were all, even talking about some smart group of guys. Oh man, and God was smart. I would sit in a group with them guys, and they would tell me this and that, and tell me what ERP was, and show me. Where the load at, where this at, and show me this watts. Uh, he say, uh, we go, when we build your amp, the amplifier you got, it's like a big modulator. And then he say, think of it as a big modulator. Don't think of it as an amplifier, you know. 
Uh, God, he said, you're running against God with linears and you're running the amplifier. Well, they told me the difference between a linear and an amplifier, you know. And a linear is something that, that, that makes some power, you know, just make power. But anyway, they, they, that's the way they talked to me. And then they would come out and they would show me this and that. And then I got to be really tight, you know, with real some of them. And I got, I got a couple of guys, they would only work on my station. They were only, they got the one left, the one, the smartest one, he, he, my station, the only one he would work on. But he's taught me everything. I know how to do almost anything that could ever go wrong. I don't have no breakdowns. I blew, nobody know it, but me and you and uh, 260, I blew. Uh, I bl 47,000 people. Oh, I blew, uh, oh, I don't care. I'll cut it out, I'll cut it out. Uh, uh, I blew, uh, I blew a blocking cap on the pro mod. Man, it? it sounds like a 12 gauge shotgun shell, doesn't it? And uh, the gauge told me. The, the gauge just told me what it was. And uh, the uh, the plate was still there, and I key and nothing go out. And I sit there, and I go, okay. I'm sitting there looking at the gauges. I know what that is. <laughs> But what happened, I started hearing noise come through my radio uh, like a week before, and the, the blocking cap, uh, uh, when the blocking cap go out, you start getting like feedback to your radio. You, you know that, huh? And you can hear it arcing, and it's, you can hear the sound. Yeah. yeah. And so I had an inkling that one, one of the blocking caps was getting, yeah. Yeah, I'm not. There you go. Well, my man, I'm going to put this. Yeah. This is my last question. I'm going to let you go. Oh, okay. Very last question. Off. Is there anything that you want to say to. I mean, this is going to run with your name on it forever. Is there anything that you want to, like, say publicly that this is what I stand for? This is how I feel about something? Uh. What do you want to have as a living memory for yourself? I felt, I felt that a lot of people look up to me because I've been around a long time and I did a lot for the game. The big boxes really didn't come, they didn't really go big until I went big. I went big and everybody started following the suit. So uh, I give back a lot now to the guys. I give back. To a lot, I help a lot of people on the phone. I spend sometimes hours a day telling guys what to put together, what not to do, what not to do this here. Uh, I do a lot of that. I give back. And then I tell them, they go, well, what? They say, are you kidding? 50, 60,000? No, no, no. My famous key eight, 20 to 22. And I sit there until somebody make me move. I said, but you can make me move. You're on five on me. <laughs> I'll move. I say, but everything runs smooth right there. I run right there. I'm enveloping about 45, 50,000 watts of envelope. But I'm running about 22,000 RMS. I sit there and cruise. The radio's more smooth. The driver's smooth. The big box is not grunting or anything. I sit there and uh, I say, uh, I talk, I know when to talk, and you know, and I only have a couple of guys that I won't, just won't let talk, you know. Uh, I don't know, I'm a joker. I'm a comedian on the radio. After about five key shows, I get tired of talking to a guy and I start joking. And uh, I, as long as I got the RF, the of the shit that comes out of here. Uh, like, uh, where did that come from? The RF gives me, makes it seem like it floats out. My amplifier is not close to me. It's, it's 18 feet away. But uh, seem like I start telling jokes after about the fifth, sixth cue so. So you get me and Switchblade to lock up. I love going to him, dude. He is fun. Uh, and he, and it's going to be, it's going to be funny. And uh, I say, tell, uh, tell that, tell that, uh, the guy with the, the, the monkey down in Southern Cal with the tail I cut off yesterday, tell him to key up. Oh man, I'm not going to say that. I said, man, I said, this is my last key. I said, but, uh, I will say something funny 
and the guy would jump. You know, when you say something funny about somebody and something in the, and somebody would jump, but when they jump, they'll jump ready in my condition. I mean, I'm on, I'm on my condition. So when, I'm, when I got my condition, I'm King Tut on my condition. And, and when I ain't got condition, then I might not even key. I just sit there and look. If I ain't got no, nothing at all, I have to have, it have to just drift away, away. But if I got condition, I know I got it. I know I got it. I know. And most guys are not willing to spend that much money on a station they, they come at me. They got guys with the money, but they don't have the knowledge, and, the, and they, they're not willing to spend. You know, I told them, I said, if you guys want my location, give me $2 million, and I take the dog and leave. I say that a lot, you know. You say it, yeah. Yeah, and I say because you guys are thinking you, they, they thinking the biggest station is the biggest box. Not necessarily. It's not like that. I say the engineer designed something for me, that do a hell of a lot of watts. But if I was trying to run two of these tubes, I wouldn't be able to run the tube. And I would get my, somebody come along with a 10,000 or 3,000 pair of threes and kick my butt because I can't run the box. And so, so, I, so I got everything balanced and they taught me well. And I know, how to, I know how to keep myself running. I know not to do nothing dumb. You know, I know I'm preaching to the choir talking to you. You know not to do something dumb to your own station. Do something they don't like, you know. You know, if your reflex is out of sight, you're not going to sit there and hit that foot paddle, you know, because you know something is wrong up there somewhere. You know, and a lot of guys don't know that. They'll just keep you know, the... Key in the rain. I don't, yeah. I don't do that. Or key, I don't, key the antenna cover to the ice and snow. Don't do that. No. It cause problems. You yeah. Know, yeah. You, you're, getting ready, you're getting ready to get your gloves out and you have your beam on the ground and your, your line or whatever, you know. So, but no, I enjoy I enjoy the radio. It's been a it's a life it's a lifestyle for me. It's not just a hobby. It's a lifestyle. This is my life. Yeah. I mean, this is I live this from when I get up until I go to bed. Wow. Every, one of my friends is radio guys. Everything I do is radio. This is my life. Well, it's been a pleasure spending the afternoon with you. This I I have girl I have a girlfriend and. You know, I'm a I'm a 32nd degree Mason. I have yeah, Mason man. friends. How long have you been traveling, man? Oh, ever since I was raised from a dead level. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Shut up, you're straight to talk shit. Thank you for this afternoon.